So in our last two videos, we've already found these two expressions. So here is the results that we obtained summarized. Now we can find, now we can try to find these two expressions as well. So first of all, let's start with the expected value of momentum. So earlier in the book, David Griffiths actually proved that you can evaluate momentum with this formula. So you can take the derivative of the expected value of x directly. And because this is a constant, this is going to be zero. So this is actually just equal to zero. So we're actually already done. So this is equal to zero. The expected value of p squared is slightly more complicated. So in order to calculate this, we're going to have to revert back to basic principles. So we have the end stationary state. We take the conjugate. So David Griffiths draws a star to signify the conjugate. So I'm just going to do just that. So some of you might prefer putting a bar on top to signify a conjugate. And then we have the momentum operator squared and then the end stationary state. So we're going to have to solve this. So remind ourselves that the original formula, we're actually, we actually don't use the end stationary state. We use the complete wave function. So this is just the x component of this function. But uh, we can still use this sort of simplified function because the t component is imaginary. So uh, the conjugate with this, uh, this component, they're going to cancel out. So all we're going to be left with is the x component, so the end stationary state. So we don't have to deal with the, f the complete wave function. We can only just uh, deal with the end stationary state. So let's try to take the constants out. So sorry, this should be a reduced plan constant. So i squared is equal to negative 1. So we get negative h bar squared. So we have the conjugate. And then we have d squared of the stationary state. And then we can actually simplify this form, uh, this uh, term here by observing the Schrodinger equation. So when we were solving the Schrodinger equation, we arrived at something like this, right? So this is the energy level corresponding to the nth stationary state. And then because within 0 and a for an infinite square well, the potential is equal to 0, so we can ignore this part. So the d square of the uh, n stationary state is actually equal to this. So we can actually substitute this into our integral to simplify it. So the expected value of p square is equal to negative h bar square 0 to a and then the conjugate multiplied by this term. And you see that we can pull the constants out. So we have 2n en. And then when the conjugate multiplies with the original, you get the absolute value squared dx. And by definition, this term is equal to 1 because this term here is normalized. So this is going to be equal to 1. So you get 2n en. And then en, as we found before, so this, uh, David Griffiths proved this in the earlier examples. The energy level corresponding to the nth stationary state is given by this expression. So we see that in the end, uh, the, the expected value of p squared is equal to this. So it's n pi h bar divided by a squared. So now that we have all this, we can find the standard deviation of x and y. So starting with standard deviation of x, so let's try to find the variance first. So that's going to be equal to the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x and then squared. So the, uh, we just retain this term over here. So 1 third minus 1 half n pi squared and then the expected value of x and then squared is just a squared over 4. So you see that there's a 1 third minus 1 fourth, that's just 1 over 12. So this is the variance of x, and the standard deviation is just taking the square root. So once you take the square root, you get something like this. So you can do the same thing for 
momentum, so the expected value of p squared minus the expected value of p and then squared. So you see that we found that expected value of p is zero, so we can just ignore that term. So essentially all we have here is just n pi h bar divided by a squared. And then when you take the square root to find the standard deviation, it's just n pi h divided by a. Now also for this expression, I'm going to pull out a 2. So you see why, why I'm doing this later on. So pulling out the 2 will be easier for you to see uh, the uncertainty principle. So I'm just going to be multiplying a 4 inside, so there's a 2 n pi squared. So this is the standard deviation of x. This is the standard deviation of p. So now we're going to test these uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that this is always true. So let's try to find out whether it's true for the uh, infinite square well. So the standard deviation of x, we just copy that down. So it's 1 third minus 2 divided by n pi squared. And then the standard deviation of p is just this. So the a, they cancel out. So I'm going to keep the h bar outside over 2. So now you see why I pulled out the 2, so that it will assemble this. And then the n pi, I'm going to multiply it inside the square root. So we get n pi squared divided by 3. And the n pi squared is just going to be cancelled out with this, so minus 2. So the problem is, is this always larger than h bar over 2? So we can check for the case n equal to 1. So n equal to 1 is going to be the smallest case. And then when n is equal to 1, uh, this expression is going to be equal to pi squared over 3 minus 2. And then if you substitute these numbers into a calculator, this is actually larger than 1. So this whole expression here is always larger than h bar over 2. So for the uh, infinite square well, we actually prove that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is satisfied. So when n is larger, so 2 or 3 or 4, uh, this is only going to get larger, so it has to be larger than h bar over 2. So once we prove that uh, this expression here is larger than 1 for n equal to 1, we know that uh, this product is always larger than h bar over 2. So always larger than h bar over 2. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is uh, satisfied.